Greetings, children of the night. This is episode number 86 of the most blood-curling oral experience on the internet. The Avocado Ghoulcast. This evening's topic is appropriately mystery games. Games of enigmas and conundrums, where danger lurks around every corner, and nothing is quite what it seems. We will discuss what makes the genre tick, tick, tick. But before we get to that, let me introduce myself. I am Merv, your host for this evening. And joining me, my chilling companion, He's making his podcast debut, and he did it in the conservatory with the lead pipe. Give a warm welcome to Colonel Mustard. Uh, Merv, are you trying to make me look stupid in front of the other guests? A little bit, yeah. So, (laughs) okay, I can't give up this voice for the entire (laughs) evening, uh, because that would ruin me. So, yeah, I have actually played a lot of the board game Clue. Oh, yeah. I have a collection going of that. Yeah. Like all the different versions? I do, yeah. And once people realized I was collecting it, they started giving it to me. So now I have versions I didn't even want, right? So, but I've played, you know, Simpsons Clue, Golden Girls Clue. There's a Golden Girls Clue? There, there is, but it's not based on murder. It's based on who stole the cheesecake. That you seems that. more appropriate for Golden <laughs> Girls. Um, do they have like a. Do you have the British version? Do you have one that's like Cluedo? I do. I do, yeah. And they have even like, um, I got the fancy version, so I had like um, pewter weapons, little mini uh, fancy weapons to put on the board. That's awesome. I think, because my version of Clue, I think is, because uh, I bought it in Canada, I think it's actually bilingual. So that's nice to have both the languages on the board. Uh I don't know if you can get that in the States, though. Um, I have foreign language versions, but I think you're right. They're all monolingual <laughs> within the game themselves. I'll have to double check the version I have. Um, but yeah, it's it's nice to that it's become this kind of like super popular thing. Um, the old board game club I used to participate in, uh, there are three or four people there who were obsessed with Clue. So we had to play mm-hmm. it every single time. Uh, which I was fine to do because I quite enjoyed it. It's popular for a reason. It's like a perfect encapsulation of a little, it's what makes mystery games great, right? Logical reasoning and, and dumb luck and fun personalities. And I mean, they, they, they hit a home run with that one for sure. Absolutely. Especially once you get into advanced clue strategy, where you do things like, if you can all really do this if you have, you know, four or five people playing, but you do things like you block off doors so that people can't exit rooms. <laughs> and I've you, never done that. No. Um, you suggest people, not because you actually think they did it, but just to move them to another room on the board. Yep. Now that I have done. <laughs> <laughs> I deployed that strategy so much. Like every time I play it with my family, uh, when I'm back home with them, uh, like, I just troll my dad and suggest him every time and just move around the board so he can't I see you anything. heading for the ballroom. You're not getting there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great strategy. Uh, but in the world of video games, because uh, we we're talking about mystery video games today, or really any kind of video game, just to start things off, what have you been playing? Oh, well, so I have to give you a bit of a preface here. If you had asked me about this, if we had talked last week, um, I would have been gushing over immortality, which I know we'll be discussing later. This That's evening. a new so Sam Barlow joint, right? It is, yes. And uh, so I won't go into too much detail on it here because I know we're going to talk about it a bit later in the mystery game topic. But unfortunately, that since we are recording this week, I have to be honest and tell you that uh, I have never played um, Stardew Valley. I've never played Animal Crossing. But for some reason, for the past week, I've been obsessed with Disney Dreamlight Valley, which is those two games plus The Sims all crammed together into one game, basically. I didn't know that was out yet. 
it just came out. I think okay. it's in, I don't want to say early access because I mean, it's, it's Disney. It's super polished. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it plays like a, a, a finished game, but yeah, you just, you walk around, you know, all the characters. Cause of course they're Disney, you farm, you give them presents, you go fishing. It's a real stress reliever. <laughs> and um, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it pulls you in and, and, you know, oh, I just got to catch five more fish tonight. And then suddenly it's three hours later. Right. So yeah, yeah, it's not my style of game usually, but I have been playing it endlessly. <laughs> I like the, like, I'm looking at the steam page right now and it looks really, it looks really gorgeous. Like they've it's... nailed that particular style. Mm -hmm. Um, Graphically, it's impressive. I like that it's got a little bit of that, um, like that purple and green aesthetic that you often associate with mobile games and like cheap fantasy games, but here it feels kind of elevated. It is, yeah, that's a good word for it because you you are doing tasks that you do in other games, but so far it has not felt like a grind. It hasn't felt repetitive it might be like you need to craft this thing and that requires 10 stacks of wood so okay i have to go find 10 stacks of wood but it's everywhere like it's not they don't they don't make you work for it because of course i mean kids are going to be playing this right and they're just not going to have the patience to to grind <laughs> um and so a lot of the things you're trying to do i i mean are more accomplishable than they will, might be in other games and i like i said i'm really playing it as a I don't want to think too much for the next block of hours, and it's it's really good for that. It's the opposite of a mystery game. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't underestimate um, like kids' ability to get into these repetitive tasks because they're super duper into the Animal yeah. Crossing. Um, like, I know, and I know, like, it's not just. Like we, we typically think of it as like this game for like millennials kind of fantasizing about the homes they'll never own kind of game. <laughs> uh, but like definitely it's popular um, with with the children too. Like oh, sure. it's a family game for sure. And I think they're trying to tap into that um, with Dreamlight Valley. So we'll see how they go. Uh, with it it's i mean like you said it's an early access which is a weird thing to say about a disney game right yeah and i mean it's, it's early access but i have yet to run across a single translation problem a single bug something i can't get to it, it, it plays like a, a game that's been out for a year that's great um I guess maybe they might refine the systems, maybe rebalance it a little bit. I don't know if they're going to do like, I mean, it's a full, not exactly a full price game, but it doesn't seem like it's a, like a microtransaction heavy kind of experience, right? There are some, but you can ignore them. You can just go right along playing the game and not, you know, all the microtransactions are for cosmetics, right? Oh, I really want to go for this particular t-shirt or hats or something like that. okay so house, it's not house like decoration or something like that it's like the sims in that regard right all those um hey here's your vacation pack type thing well in this case it's a pixar pack right so okay so it's not like pay us five dollars to make the carrots grow faster correct yeah okay because that would be like we all have bad i mean we didn't most of us didn't play it but a lot of us have bad experiences of dungeon keeper mobile and all that kind of nonsense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so glad that they've managed to steer clear of that. So far, uh, yeah. And there's, I can tell there's lots of, you know, inaccessible doors where they plan to put new content later. Oh, so, like, it's set in, in a particular, like, Disney, I guess, the titular Dreamlight Valley. So there's stuff kind of already there for you that you unlock as you progress. There, yeah, there's stuff already there, your house, and then there's base characters who are there to, you know, interact with and do stuff with. And then there's characters that are already programmed in, but you have to, you know, unlock their door, and then you can go meet them. And then there are characters where you cannot unlock their door because they have not been added to the game yet. Okay, hence early access. Right. All right. That makes a lot of sense. Anything else you wanted to tell us about Dreamlight Valley? 
No, I mean, I, like I said, I'm a little ashamed that that is my what I've been playing this week because I'm I'm a grown adult man with no children. So, but I mean, it's been extremely relaxing. I have to say. As a grown adult man with no children himself, I fully 100% approve of this. So <laughs> go ahead. Have the fun you want to have. Uh, How about you? As for me, simple. I have been playing a... I mean, I've been playing two video games. Uh, the one that I've been enjoy enjoying a lot is Xenoblade Chronicles 3, which I've been playing on my Switch. Uh, but on the previous episode, I talked about that game at length, and I like to mix things up, keep things fresh. So instead, I'm going to talk about the other game that I've been playing, a game by the name of Soul Hackers 2, which I've been playing, funnily enough, on PC. So I don't know how familiar you are with the whole Shin Megami Tensei, Mega Ten Super franchise, how that whole uh, thing works. Not at all. <laughs> okay, so you haven't played your Personas or your... Oh, I did play Persona 5. I did not finish it, but um, I, I I took a spin through a dungeon or two. So if it's in the same universe, then yes. Uh, it's the same franchise. So good yeah. news, this game is about a third the length of that one. So <laughs> uh, it's completable, unlike Persona 5, which That's I think... That's kind of what drove me away from Persona 5, yeah. Yeah, so with that game in particular, uh, with Persona 5, I started that in april it came out in 2017 right so I, it play, started in april 2017 when it came out and i finished it in april december 29 2017 sorry so it took me all like eight months to beat during that time i moved from one coast of north america to the other and in fact during the move, I'd mistakenly left the Persona 5 disc in my PS4, and it somehow arrived intact at <laughs> the other side of the country. So, wow. uh, it was uh, it was an experience, and it was a marathon. By the yeah. end, like, um, I've been playing it on on my couch. I was living with roommates at the time, and then I was living by myself on the other side of the country. I think I finished that game playing it on, like biking on an exercise bike as i was finishing the last <laughs> cutscenes. oh because that's like that it became an exercise bike game um so i would not have linked those activities that's fascinating <laughs> yeah i i like to play turn-based rpgs on my exercise bike because it feels like you know you don't need to hand-eye coordinate in that case right you're not yeah. like doing rhythmic things with your hands which kind of messes up your rhythm with your legs so that's well if i were playing soul hackers 2 on a console instead of on pc soul hackers 2 would be my exercise bike game um so yeah like i mentioned it was the latest turn-based rpg from atlas and so same franchise as persona shin megami tensei tokyo mirage sessions devil summoner digital devil saga you I don't even know. There's so many games in this giant mega franchise <laughs> that was inspired by a series of Japanese novels, I think. Anyway, um, so if you've played Persona, this is a lot like Persona in the kind of dungeon crawling aspect. It has a lot of similarities in the combat. It's still about hitting those elemental weaknesses so you can do extra damage. Uh, but if you've played Persona, there are also a lot of differences. So, biggest difference, no time management component. That interests me quite a bit. I did not like that component. Yeah, you just go through the game at your leisure, at your own pace. You don't need to worry about uh, planning your day. There's no annoying cat telling you not to go outside after 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... There's, uh, like, you, ha like, in fact, the entire game is pretty much set at night. It's during the time when Morgana wouldn't let you go anywhere. Why is he not letting you go anywhere? I don't know, because there's weird supernatural stuff happening all around Tokyo, and people are getting murdered. Uh, so I guess he had your interest at heart all along. Um, the other narrative change here is that Instead of super teens who save the world between classes, 
you're dealing with an actual adult cast who have actual adult problems. Um, so it's refreshing in that regard. And finally, yeah. instead of... Sorry, go ahead. I said, yeah, that is refreshing, yeah. And finally, instead of having a faceless self interest not self interest self-insert protagonist, uh, there's a voice protagonist who has an actual personality, which is wonderful because... Uh, like in the trailers and the promotional footage, they tried to make her seem super cool, but the game leads into the fact that she's just a total dork. Um, <laughs> the premise is that she's not an actual human being. She is born from a super advanced AI that gave her corporeal form so that she could complete missions in the real world. And your allies are all actual humans that you have brought back from the dead with your soul hacking power okay. get it because that's the title of the game yeah okay. so it's called that's the, you're the your robot power. your robot necromancer yeah your robot necromancer uh except for once you robot necromance uh robot necromance these three people back to life you're just like you know what i'm not gonna robot necromance people anymore because it has consequences what those consequences are, I don't know. The game just told me they exist. Um, anyway, the trappings here are vaguely cyberpunk. So don't expect a big critique of corporations or the whole... Like, there's a little bit of that high-tech, low-life thing. Mm -hmm. um, but do not expect some big critique of Tai Balls or Zaibatsus or Megacorps or anything like that. This is really just for the cool aesthetics so it's not it's not cyberpunk 2077 or it's not uh final fantasy 7 where they're just like this company is draining the earth and we're going to go yeah them. no <laughs> eco terrorist attacks on the shinra power corp or anything <laughs> like that um i've never played final fantasy 7 it's remarkable that oh. i can just pull that out um, <laughs> no that's that's impressive although i'm one of those uh there are dozens of us who prefer Final Fantasy VIII. I, okay. I, I mean, I've confessed this on the podcast so many times, but I'll just throw it out there. I've never played a Final Fantasy game. Oh, there you go. Yeah. What I they like are wildly is... different from each other, so you oh, yeah. love one and hate another one. So For sure. Like The early ones are top-down with turn-based combat. They've got ATB later, and then you've got full-on action in Final Fantasy XV. Uh, it keeps switching up and switching up. Um, but one thing I like to say uh, to annoy Final Fantasy fans, if they ask me if I've played a Final Fantasy game, I said, I say, yeah, sure, I've played Kingdom Hearts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so really, I played a whole bunch there you of go. Them. Disney, D Disney Dreamlight Valley plus Final Fantasy equals Kingdom Hearts. Pretty much. Yeah. So you could say you've played a Kingdom Hearts game. Uh, I don't think I've played a Kingdom Hearts game, except, yeah, I like the actual actual series but exactly yeah uh, i'm but... sorry i've taken you off track tell me more about soul hacking that's okay tracks are not a thing to be adhered to today um so yeah it's it's vaguely this the cyberpunky kind of aesthetic but really it's just cool stuff happens at night and there's neon and ramen and like alleyways and a cool nighttime bar that i wish we had here in Canada, although it probably wouldn't work very well because it's too cold to operate an outdoor bar most of the year. Um, anyway, combat turn-based. So the way it works, very dungeon crawly, very old school dungeon crawly. We're kind of uncovering these like very haphazardly arranged corridors and you defog the, the dungeon as you walk right. through it. Um, so not like the bespoke dungeons of Persona 5. Very old school dungeon crawling. And then you get into combat when you encounter an enemy uh, in the dungeon. Standard turn-based Persona Shin Megami Tensei-esque combat. Except for instead of getting an extra turn when you hit a weakness, what happens is your character's equipped demon enters a stack. At the end of that turn, all the demons in the stack do an extra attack together called a Sabbath, and that just does massive AoE damage to the entire enemy team. 
How many how many demons can go into a stack? So, as of where I am right now in the game, by default up to four because you have four people on your team. But there are upgrades you can use to kind of add more in or get multiple attacks, uh, which I admit I haven't used yet because I'm not that far into the game. Uh, so yeah, the strategy now is a little bit different than in Persona, where you try to hit a weakness and then you kind of try to have a hit, uh, like a chain of weaknesses that you can hit, uh, so you can get all these extra turns in a row. Um, here it's really like more about managing subtle trade-offs. So, you know, do I hit a weakness so I do a small amount of damage, or do I try to hammer one enemy, enemy repeatedly to remove them from the field? Um, do I waste my demon switching power because that's limited on trying to hit a weakness? Um, do I try a new type of attack to see if I can find a weakness, or do I stick with what's tried and true? So you have all these little kind of mini strategies within mm -hmm. uh, a combat encounter. Um, so I take I take it like each demon does something different. If you don't put them into the stack, they they help you out in some other way. Well, not exactly. In that you have an equipped demon, and that's that determines what attacks you can use. Okay. And some of them get special powers when they get added to the Sabbath stack. So if you use that demon to hit an enemy's weakness, when they are in that Sabbath attack, they might have a special power like poisoning the other team or healing you for some amount of uh, HP. Okay, I like that. That's good. So sometimes, yeah, it does pay to have a certain demon equipped because then they'll... Do, they'll use that special power. Um, so yeah, overall, decent fun. I wouldn't say it's as absorbing as something like Persona or as narratively compelling, but I think if you're looking for something lighter weight, it's not a bad... You know how people kind of kind of say there's like 7 out of 10 games, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want some good and offensive fun, it's there. Um, I can say it runs pretty well on PC, though I had to install a fan patch to fix a horrid bug. Uh, but other than that, like performance is pretty good. So don't worry. It's not super taxing. It's not going to make your computer scream like a jet engine or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a couple of those games, for sure. Um, and I would say if you like games like Tokyo Mirage Sessions or Digimon Story, it's really for people who are more into those kinds of games that I'd say something like Persona, which is a lot more involved and has these other components. So, yeah, check it out if that's the kind of thing you like. If you're not into dungeon-crawling JRPGs, then steer clear and play a mystery game, which <laughs> we're going to talk about in a little bit. But before we get to that, we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss three recent big news stories that happened. Uh, this is going to come out around Halloween, so these are not going to be recent by the time you listen to this podcast, but if you want to keep up with what happened a month ago, this is the podcast for you. Um, first one I wanted to mention, I don't know how big you are into PC gaming. Um, I do most of, most of my gaming on PC. There's, um, um, so let's say, you know, 33% on the PlayStation and the rest on PC. Okay, so then you'll have something to say about this. <laughs> uh, you've probably heard of a company called EVGA. They were one of the biggest and most important graphics cards manufacturers in the biz, and they specialized in building cards based on NVIDIA chipsets. So they take the NVIDIA chipset and they stick it on the, the board and add the memory and the fans and the cooling system and all the other fun circuitry. Um, they decided to step away from the graphics card business and focus entirely on their other PC component businesses, which I believe is power supplies and a couple of other things. Okay. Um, so this is huge news. Like one of the biggest graphics cards manufacturers in the world. So it's like, yeah, we're not making graphic cards anymore because right. we were selling a lot of cards at a loss and NVIDIA would just do stuff without telling us. Um, 
for instance, like selling their own quote unquote founders editions of cards at ridiculously low prices that undercut what would allow EVGA to make profit. So yeah, I hadn't I hadn't heard about this. I mean, the business practice itself sounds very familiar in you know, non graphics card <laughs> businesses, uh, but yeah, I didn't I didn't know that they had um, split. Yeah, it's it just happened. I mean, the news story that I linked is from the 16th of September, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, as of this recording, and it's I think it's going to send ripples through the industry because now. There's an example, like NVIDIA's always had a history of weird relationship with its partners, but now this has had high profile consequences. So we'll see, they're forging ahead. They've decided that they're going to keep their newest chipsets super highly priced. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's what companies like EVGA really want. I don't know, but it's going to be interesting to see who kind of steps in to fill the vacuum whether we're going to get a lot more cards from i don't know gigabyte msi zotac companies like that all right second big news story that we should discuss a large component of i should say large component a large amount of grand theft auto 6 material leaked online yeah um, that I, I heard, did I haven't seen any of it, but I did hear about it. Yeah. I saw like one video, but apparently there are like 90 of them. And they show the game in a very early stage in development. So there's like placeholder audio and placeholder mm -hmm. dialogue. And a lot of places, instead of actual dialogue, it'll be things like, I don't know, uh, cashier complains or something like that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, because it's super early in development, right? Right. They, yeah. Like you're nothing's been finalized. Yeah. So there, like, there are a lot of places where textures are missing, or just like debug stuff appearing on the screen, and it graphically does not look ultra impressive or anything. Uh, but yeah, it looks like. GTA 6 is in development, and there are two protagonists, a male uh, protagonist and a female protagonist, as was leaked uh, long before this particular leak. Mm -hmm. um, Rockstar says the leak won't affect development. We'll see. I mean, we won't really know whether or not that turns out to be true, because we won't be privy to internal details at Rockstar. But Well, do you know if anything in the leak gave away like super spoilery types of you know, content or was it just hey yep this sure is a grand theft auto game i would say more the latter it's not like when a large portion of half-life 2 leaked and they ended up redeveloping a lot of the game um this is fairly like it's the stuff you'd expect to be in a gta 6 people screaming insults someone walking around in a strip club you know, your standard gta kind of stuff um so the funny thing about this news story is that there are a lot of people on the internet who don't know how game development works, <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, so some, let's say, not so bright people were very harsh on the footage. They you don't say. Yeah, say, <laughs> look, Jakey and unfinished. <laughs> I they... mean, so sorry, if, if, if GTA 6 was supposed to come out next week, I, I would get that. Right, like, uh oh, yeah. do do they have a, a release date, like even sort of release date in mind, or no? They do not. Okay, so they're yeah, they haven't even cracked the eggs yet, and people are complaining that the, the cake isn't baked well. Sounds like. Yeah, this is like someone just bought a stand mixer. That's where we're at in this process. <laughs> 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 so what this ended up. Uh, resulting in is a lot of devs started tweeting in progress footage of uh, games that are already out so i got to see and i'll, I'll throw this in the link down because it's incredible some early footage of control where there's just oh. placeholder assets everywhere and the character model for the main character jesse looks completely different like she's running around in a in a skirt and a business suit instead of like the leather jacket and pants she has on 
in um, the actual game. It's really wild. Uh, so, so they released him just to say, like, yeah, it's early act. It's in development. This is what development games look like. Like, I wouldn't have even been that polite. But this is why I should not work in PR. I would tweeted something <laughs> regrettable, like, yeah, dummies. It it doesn't look good because we're still building it. Peace out. <laughs> oh no, it was it was super sarcastic because <laughs> I think one uh, person um, who reacted to this wrote something like. Um, graphics are one of the first things that's finished in game development and like they add in like, the AI and the scripting later so all these devs were tweeting sarcastically oh yeah for sure graphics are some of the first things finished in game development <laughs> and showing all these janky looking or crappy looking assets from way in the beginning of the production process so yeah the internet famous for nuanced arguments absolutely <laughs> and finally i don't really want to talk about this in depth because i don't know that much about twitch but we'd be remiss if we didn't mention it uh, after a bunch of drama that i am not even going to try to get into but it involves a streamer scamming his acquaintances to cover gambling losses um a bunch of streamers banded together to annoy, announce a boycott of Twitch over Christmas unless Twitch took action to restrict gambling streams. Mm -hmm. So Twitch announced that as of October 18th, you cannot stream uh, online slots, you cannot steam, stream roulette, you cannot stream online dice games. So like, no purely chance gambling okay. on streams as of October 18th. This doesn't affect things like sports betting, poker, Texas Hold'em, stuff like that, because those are considered, I guess, to be skill-based games, right? As opposed to yeah. roulette, which involves no skill whatsoever. Right. So, and I guess yeah. prob an understanding of probability, but beyond that, no skill. Well, I, and I'm... I'm struggling to, I mean, I'm not one of those kids these days watching video games. And I, I watch some streams, I, but I am struggling to understand what the draw of watching someone play roulette is. Because <laughs> um, I guess people are really entertaining when they do it. So they're like, oh man, I'm going to hit the big time. They like make a, a character out of it almost. And I guess that's entertaining to watch. Like, I, I don't want to be the the adult is like man kids these days are into some stupid stuff because right. like i'm in my early 30s i'm not the kind of person who's gonna like i don't have a leg to stand on here i'm into stuff that people older than me think is dumb right, right. same so i'm not gonna go down that road um but i yeah i, do... so I don't yeah. understand i get yeah i guess my question is what about chance-based gambling is immoral or or drains people of money that is not also true of something like poker what i think the big issue is here is that a lot of streamers um do things like they they do almost promotional streams with their partner with these gambling sites so they have to, um, or what they do is like, they might be participating in rigged games or they might be playing with house money and things like that. And that's what they stream in order to like gin up an audience for these mm -hmm. sites. That's part of the problem. Um, that was actually a big problem a few years ago with these two streamers called T Martin and Syndicate who were streaming um, themselves uh, playing on Counter-Strike Global Offensive skin betting sites, so CSGO betting site, skin betting mm -hmm. sites, uh, where they were winning huge, um, and they were partnered with this website, but they didn't disclose it, which led to a whole massive scandal, and eventually led to, in the United States, the FTC stepping in and forcing streamers to disclose 
any affiliations they had or sponsorships they had for streaming content. Um, so it's kind of in that vein, like here the partnership is disclosed, but they don't have to disclose, yes, I am playing with house money, right? And that's really part of the problem. Yeah, you think that'd be more important than the person. And the fact that with. they're like, oh yeah, I'm just doing this. I'm throwing in 20 bucks of my own. Um, or like, you know, I'm getting paid to do this, but I'm not like, I'm not kind of doing it with my own money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe that's really the point of contention. Yeah. But again, I'm not super duper into streaming. So no. <laughs> like, I don't know what any of these people are. I know Poke Pokimane is. She was one of the main people spearheading this initiative, but I don't never heard of any of the other people involved. So um I mean I'm I'm for any any action that stops people from getting scammed out of their money. So yeah, if the <laughs> if this change accomplishes that, then I'm with them. Yeah, it was weird. Twitch actually did something right for a change. I am not used to Twitch making a good decision. Of course, <laughs> this might be kind of a PR move because this is also at a time when Twitch is changing the revenue split for streamers and also forcing them to run more ads during their streams. Mm -hmm. So streamers are not happy about this. It's uh, so this might be like the PR coup they need, but I don't think people are buying it. So I don't know. Yeah. Twitch just seems like a mess. I don't know how they like they lucked into being the first people there, right? Mm -hmm. Like the first people to kind of, um, capitalize on the streaming boom or even create it. I'd go as far as to say that. But they haven't shown any acumen as far as actually managing Twitch as a business. They're just there because they were the first and that's why they're so big. Do they have any like real com competition? I mean, Mixer was there for a while until um, like uh, Microsoft abandoned them. YouTube has streaming. You can stream right. stuff on YouTube. So they don't really have much of the VTuber market. That's all like on YouTube. But really, Twitch is the biggest game in town. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are three big recent news stories. Let us segue now, very elegantly, into <laughs> talking about mystery games. Yes. Favorite. Yeah. This is appropriate for Halloween, I think. Because absolutely, it is a Halloweeny kind of thing. Uh, some mystery games even have supernatural elements. Um, but like this, this genre is is huge in games, right? Some of the most beloved titles for the past couple of decades uh, have been mystery games. Ace Attorney, Danganronpa, L.A. Noir. We're just like scratching the surface by mentioning those in particular. Uh, and I don't think we've ever really taken the time on this podcast to talk about mystery games as a genre. So let's do that today. Let's talk about yeah. mystery games. I kind of want to, yeah, and I started thinking about this when you suggested talking about mystery games is the definition of a mystery game. I don't even know if you and I will agree on what counts as a mystery game and what doesn't. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get into it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel like. And this might be kind of a cop-out. I feel like genres are defined by what's in them rather than I set a bunch of parameters and then I figure out what goes under that set of parameters. I, I, feel, like I, t I feel like in general we take more of a descriptivist approach to genres than a prescriptivist approach, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. It does. So... I call things mystery games if other people call them mystery games. But I don't know if that's a satisfying response to that question. I think so. I just, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like that person who said, I, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. Right. Like I know if I'm playing a game and it's tripping a particular neuron in my brain, like, Oh yeah, this is the mystery game pleasure center that's being hit right now. Exactly. It's. I can tell you what's not a mystery game. I can tell you Tetris isn't a mystery game, but I don't know if that's a useful 
um, useful set of criteria for classifying things. Um, but yeah, I think if if I were to take a more prescriptivist approach, I would say that a mystery game is a type of game where solving not just a not just a spatial puzzle, but solving a narrative or logical puzzle is central to the playing of the game. I think I'd agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know that every game I'll mention as a mystery game actually falls within that criterion. But I will say that the games that I mentioned as not being mystery games, that kind of have mystery games elements, uh, that component is not central to the experience. I don't yeah, know if that, that makes sense. sense. It does. So for example, um, one of the games that came out recently that I love and that I would consider a mystery game is Strange Horticulture, right? Is it is there a parlor where someone is murdered and you have to interview suspects and find a murder weapon? No. All, all, you, all you do is run a plant shop and, and you give people the plants they want and you identify plants based on their, you know, uh, physiology and their, you know, effects on consuming them. And that's it. But it is absolutely a mystery in my mind. Is it kind of like you have to do logical deduction based on what you know about what the plant did? Um, sort of. So there's many components to, to Strange Horror, which is a great game, by the way. I highly recommend it. Um, people will come and say, I want, you know, I'm having trouble sleeping. I want a plant to help me. And you have to kind of logically sort through your plant guide and figure out which plant you have that might fit the bill. But there are also, um, mysterious elements, like there's a forest with a witch cult in it who you can help or, you know, actively work against. Or, or there's people that say, that send you notes that say, go find a plant out in the world somewhere and you have to logically deduce where in the world it is. And you click on a map and either it'll say, nope, you're in the wrong place. Or yes, you found a plant. Let's bring it back to your shop. Um, okay. Yeah, I can yeah. see those mystery game elements there for sure. Um, yeah. I do got to ask, though, does anyone side actually side against the witches? I figure in a game called Strange Horticulture, <laughs> you kind of want the witches on your side. I Yes, fully, I played through it beginning to end once, and I absolutely supported the witches, yes. <laughs> absolutely. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I could definitely see those mystery-solving elements. So it's logical deduction in terms of what to give people, where to go to get stuff. Um, so you're, I guess you're like a a logical problem solver almost yes yes mm -hmm. okay so you're not really you're not solving the mystery of who stole the uh sarsaparilla from the greenhouse i don't know exactly. why that was the first plant that popped into my head um but sure let's go with that you have uh, to cross-reference a lot of information someone will say i want you know x kind of plant and you can tell what the plant should be based on what it does but you have to kind of cross-reference like, okay, someone mentioned that plants that do this have red bumps. I'm going to start looking at all my plants and see what has red bumps on them, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so like you can almost interpret the parameters as you would interpret evidence, say, in a exactly. theft game or murder mystery game. Exactly, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, are there any other mystery games you've played recently? I mean, we're going to get into immortality i guess a little bit later once you talk about yeah, like unique I, yes i very much want to want to talk about immortality because so there's two that came out this year that are currently wrestling over my top game of the year spot and immortality is one of them and the other one is the centennial case one of them i have played um, that game yeah one of them strongly appeals to my left brain which is the centennial case and you both we can talk about that and how it is highly dependent on logic and reasoning and all that left brain stuff i love immortality is my right brain game of the year where you're just immersed in the story it almost doesn't matter what the answer to the mystery is it's just the journey that matters you know yeah i can i can kind of see that difference and you kind of see that in various mystery games where some are like these some are really, really focused on you piecing together the evidence, and others, you're kind of along for the ride. Um, and we'll get exactly. to that in a little bit. 
but uh, Centennial Case, I enjoyed it quite a bit more than I was expecting. Like, I, I kind of just bought it because I wanted to support this kind of game. Like, I want more big budget FMV games to get made, but I ended up Absolutely. liking yep. it quite a bit. High production values for one thing. It was, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, so the way they kind of saved on the budget here is a limited sets. Um, mm -hmm. So everything, every murder mystery takes place in a in a small set of rooms or a small set of outdoor areas. And the other way they save on the budget is that they hired a limited number of actors because oh, yeah. the same set of actors plays multiple roles over time. The framing device is that the main character is solving a mystery in the present and also a few mysteries in the past. And she, in order to help her visualize the cases in the past, she takes the faces of people she knows in the present and imagines those people in the roles in the past. Which has got to be so much fun for the actors, right? Because they get to play someone in the 1970s and they get to play someone in the 1920s and the, yeah, someone in current you know, current day and they get to play multiple characters. It's, oh, yeah. It's really, yeah. If you watch the special features that are included mm -hmm. with the game, uh, if you watch their interviews, they all talk about trying to make the different characters distinct and playing those different roles. It's a... Uh, I think they job. had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I like that they were, it's multiple mysteries. It's not just one, right? But they do tie them together in an overarching story. Yeah, and they tie them together in a way that, so my experience with this game was I, I played it through. It took me quite a bit of time. I reached the end credits, and then I put it down. And I didn't realize what I had to do was open it back up and there's like this little thing on the menu that shines at the bottom and that unlocks the epilogue so i ended up watching the epilogue um like i think two months after i'd originally played the game when someone told mm -hmm. me there was an epilogue I was like wait i missed this um i might so have I missed it too i'm trying to think if i saw the epilogue or not because it's been a while since i've played it i'll have to go look after we're done here <laughs> um did you get to the big reveal about uh what's his name Josui. i think so so um we're not going to spoil it on the podcast yeah let's not spoil it but, <laughs> uh, but there is a big reveal about i wouldn't call this person the like there's a let's say there's a protagonist in the present and there's a protagonist long in the past um and there's a deuteragonist long in the past i would call this person the deuteragonist in the past uh and there is a very very big reveal about this person that recontextualizes mm -hmm. a lot of the game and they in fact have refilmed from some scenes with that recontextualization. And there's a reason I'm talking about this very awkwardly that I'm not going to spoil. Anyway, right. go play this game. <laughs> that, that will be a challenge with when discussing mystery games. We can't give you the, the thing that makes them so great, which is a satisfying ending, right? So, um, but I really, really liked this game. I liked the interface for how to solve the mysteries themselves, the kind of, you put evidence together, you make hypothesis, you think to yourself, why would they'll give you like multiple possible ways this could have gone and none of them are ridiculous, right? Yeah, all of them are plausible. They're Some plausible. just feel like the way you dismiss them is not so much this is implausible, it's more like this doesn't fit with other things or this has no motive, right? Right. That's how you kind of dismiss theories because the whole point is to construct a sequence of theories that kind of all fit together. Rather and than, I liked that they, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish your thought. Uh, I was going to say, rather than four or five isolated theories that all make sense in and of themselves, but don't fit with the character motivations right. or don't fit the other evidence. Right. But there's no gotchas in this game. There's no like, ha ha, you missed this critical piece and thus didn't solve the mystery correctly. 
you will you will get all of the pieces of information you need to reach the logical conclusion. Now, did I reach the correct conclusion on every single decision? No, I did not. But I never felt like they cheated me, right? I will say there's one mystery I felt I was cheated slightly, but it's been a while. <laughs> you don't since have to I've... say much about it, but which one? Uh, it's been a while since I played the game, but it's the one with the lounge with the uh, cabaret club singer. Okay. Um, I feel like um, when you try to identify the motive, you're not given enough information. Okay. But other than that, I would not say this game cheats you. Um, right. Everything is there. Um, all the information is laid out. And in fact, you can make the game easy for yourself because the way it's set up is that you have a sequence of let's say main concepts and then you add explanations to them or theories around these main concepts yes. um, so you kind of so click i'll and make drag. one up this isn't a real one right so i found you know a bloody dagger in the bathroom okay how did the bloody dagger get in the bathroom oh hypothesis number one uh you know the maid dropped it there on her way fleeing the crime scene. Okay, hypothesis number two, the dog picked it up in its teeth and dropped it in the bathroom. And then you just think to yourself like, yes, that makes sense, or no, that doesn't make sense in the larger narrative story. Yeah, yeah. and you're, all the evidence um, or all the theories are all in one kind of pool. So one piece of evidence might be something like, I don't know, there's tissue paper taped to the bedroom wall mm -hmm. and that would not apply to the um to the knife being in the bathroom so right. you could try to click and drag it over and then the game would reject it um one way you can kind of trivialize this is there are little uh patterns on the edges of each uh, question and all the hypotheses have matching patterns so you can if you want to trivialize this for yourself just match up the patterns mm -hmm. um, yep. I think it, you couldn't turn those off at the time I played the game, but now you can toggle that on and off. Um, oh, can you? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and they released an update that allows you to toggle it on and off, but that was after I completed the game, unfortunately. I um, saw those. I did eventually figure out that you could do that, but I did not avail myself of the, like, oh, I'm going to start looking for those patterns because I can't figure out what to do next. I. I played fair, but uh, and they weren't super um, yeah. obtrusive, you know. I played I played fair until I realized that the pie was <laughs> batch up because I didn't realize this until about sixty percent of the way through the game, because uh, the game never tells you. <laughs> no, yeah, they don't point it out. Mm -mm. So, yeah. No, yeah, it was it was absolutely it is fighting for one of my for top game of the year for me. I really really liked that one. Oh wow! Um, I think it, I think it might just like barely make it in in my top ten. Uh, mm -hmm. But I played a lot of video games this year. So. Yeah, I don't play as many. It's most a handful per year, so it's it's not hard to be on my top ten. But top one is is where the impress impressive games live, and and that is certainly in contention for it. Absolutely, I I really did enjoy it. I think I would love to play not a sequel of these characters. Mm -hmm. but a sequel with the same cast playing a completely different set of mysteries? Sure, I would be so down for that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Did you, and you played it in Japanese? Yeah, I'm not going to dub, I'm dub, not gonna not dub over live action. I will yeah. dub willy-nilly over animation, because uh, mm -hmm. you can match the lip flaps or whatever, but on live action, God, no. I can't deal with dubbed live action. It, I think it was accidentally on dub when I started it, and I, I like, I've panicked, started like reaching for my mouse, like, no, how do I fix this? Because this is awful. And then the second it was in Japanese, it was like, okay, this is much better. <laughs> yeah, and I will say I am not a sub purist by any means. I play my video games dubbed. I watch most of my anime dubbed, but yeah, I can't do live action dubs. I'm sorry, they just do not work for me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's Centennial Case. Another recent mystery game that I was also kind of playing, I think I was almost playing this concurrently, or I'd play it just after Centennial Case, um, was I, the Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative. So 
that's a sequel, a surprise sequel, in fact, to Eye of the Somnium Files. I didn't think the first Eye of the Somnium Files would ever get a sequel. Um, have you played Eye at all? No, I haven't. I'm, I'm interested to hear your description of it, because if it sounds appealing, I'm going to go get it right away. I, I Okay, I will say the first game is great. I did not like the second one as much. Um, mm -hmm. But the premise is that you're a detective in, I guess, future Tokyo, because everything is set in future Tokyo. <laughs> um, and the main kind of defining feature of this world is you have an AI assistant embedded in your eye socket who helps you solve crimes. And the way you solve crimes is you dive into people's minds. Okay. So you like abduct them or get them to go consensually with you to a police station and then you stick them in a device called the Somnium device. I think that's what it's called. And then you dive into their mind, but you have a six minute time limit. Otherwise, very bad things will happen. Oh, dear. So part of the um, of the game is about rummaging through someone's wacky psyche, whack, someone's wacky psyche mm -hmm. in order to uncover their motive or uncover an explanation for a crime. And use okay. that to generate circumstantial evidence that you can then go verify with real evidence to solve a murder mystery. I like everything you just said except timed. <laughs> so, yeah, the first game can get really aggressive. The second game is like super easy to deal with the timer. Um, the way it works is that time only ticks when you're moving. It's like super hot. Uh, but... <laughs> in people's brains and you kind of go around to it's kind of like a almost like a 3d point and click adventure game mm -hmm. um and different actions in the game uh will take away more time than others but there are also actions you can do to gain what are called timies which allow you to modify the timers on certain actions. So you might investigate, you might invest, say, five seconds investigating a cup that you don't think has anything to do with the mystery, but investigating the cup might give you a timey that allows you to cut down the other timers to, say, half time. I see. Gotcha. So there's kind of the strategic component on top of the mystery solving component. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I'll have to look into that a bit more. It sounds a little bit like um, Lucifer Within Us, which I played a couple of years ago. Did you ever play that? No, I hadn't even heard of it. Okay, so it's got a super wacky premise, which is you are, <laughs> it's very futuristic, you are some sort of religious figure that can identify that people are possessed by demons and causing them to commit murders. And as long as you can, one, solve the mystery of you know the murder, you have to do that first, but then you have to name the demon that's within them to, ex um, to exorcise them. And then that's, you know, there are multiple cases and each one is one, solve the mystery, two, exorcise the demon. Um, it's very strange, but it, it has a lot of, the same components of what you just mentioned, which is you walk around, you interview people, they give you their, you know, version of events, be it the truth or a lie. Uh, yeah. And then you can kind of, you can focus in on things on multiple levels. Like you can focus in on the sounds that were occurring during their memory. So if you hear a bell, you can be like, okay, so someone rang the bell over there at the same time this person was shot. Oh, and this person's over here. So they can't have been the one to do it because they were over there ringing the bell. No, that kind of thing, right? Um, you can see suspects' perspectives of other suspects. You cross-reference their memories. And if they don't match, you can be like, okay, someone's lying here, right? Um, but it, it's not timed. <laughs> you don't have to be like, uh-oh, I better run across to this other person real quick or something bad's going to happen. Yeah, there's that. I mean, the time thing can be stressful for sure. Um, but it does have a lot of what you're describing, especially the, 
oh, that happened over there. So the person standing over here definitely couldn't have heard it or done it or seen it. Very right. definitely, there's definitely a lot of that in I the Somnium files. Uh, I should say the Somniums are only a, I would say, a third to half of what the game is. Most of it is a visual novel, uh, where you're just kind of clicking through the story as it unfolds, and also, there is a little bit of logical deduction that happens outside the Somniums as well. Okay. So, and especially the second game has a lot more gameplay outside the Somniums in addition to uh, those timed puzzles. And, I mean, what comes up in all these mystery games is, we, we mentioned it during the Centennial case, does it, does it give you the information you need to reasonably reach the right conclusion right or does it cheat you <laughs> does it get, play gotcha with its evidence it does not play gotcha outside the somniums but the somniums operate on dream logic so good luck with that <laughs> so yeah i would not say it's like those pure it's not a pure logical deduction game by any means there's adventure game logic uh, inside the time puzzles and outside mm -hmm. the time puzzles, it operates on mystery game logic. Gabriel Knight logic, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you have both logics in one kind of game. Interesting. So uh, Yeah, I might have to check that one out. Yeah, I really enjoyed the first game. I enjoyed the second game a little less. Um, I'm not going to get into why, because that would involve a lot of spoilers. Uh, what I will say is that for both games, without spoiling anything, the game's structure is as much a mystery as the serial murders at the center of its plot. So it's not just um, it's not just a, I'm going to go solve murder mysteries on a kind of meta level. You're trying to figure out why the game is structured the way it is. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. especially true of the second game. Um, and What's nice about the first game is that the structure of the game and the lore of the game are very tied to the central mystery. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more than that, because that would spoil okay. what the central mystery is about. <laughs> um, so we've talked about games, mystery games we played recently. Um, mm -hmm. What I do want to ask is, what do you appreciate about mystery games? Or what do you think the most important part of a mystery game is? Um, I think what motivates me and a lot of people to play mystery games is, of course, that's that sense of accomplishment. You know, some people get that sense of accomplishment winning a battle mission in a shooter, right? Well, I, I that does nothing for me. What does it for me is, oh, I figured out, you know, who killed Dr. So-and-so and why. It's a, it, I've accomplished something and it's a story at the same time. And then I've, I mean, I've liked them. That's part of why my you know, screen name on the avocado is Colonel Mustard. That type of um, game has always appealed to me from childhood. And it just, once you solve the mystery, it's just so satisfying. If the game is well made, of course. <laughs> there are some that are extremely frustrating. Um, it's so interesting you, you talk about accomplishment because I don't typically... Like, I don't typically play mystery games for the accomplishment, and I could definitely see you people getting that out of it. Um, but like you, you mentioned that like the story plus accomplishment. I'm really there for the twisty story. Mm -hmm. I just like kind of interacting with it. If that makes any sense, like that's what I get out of it: being able to interact with that narrative. Oh yeah, I mean, I love story games that have no mystery components too. But a mystery game is like a story game with a crossword puzzle on top of it. It's just good plus good equals really good. Yeah, I mean, it, I do like a lot of narrative adventures. But what I think about interacting with a mystery novel, it's not so much that I, I get the sense of accomplishment or satisfaction. It's that I like, I like solving the puzzle. It's not like the the accomplishment of solving the puzzle. I just kind of like the act of thinking through it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think we're saying the same thing, yeah, in different terms. That's, yeah. that's basically how I feel, yeah. 
Oh yeah, and, and I'm not saying like if if what you get out of it is I've accomplished something playing it, like that's totally 100 percent valid. It's just like for me, it's it's a slightly different sentiment, and I think mm-hmm. that's it's also super interesting that we get kind of these different things out of it. Um, so one thing that I I really appreciate about mystery games, like I said, is is not just um, not just experiencing the story, but interacting with it. And in particular, what I like about interacting with it is doing actual detective work. And I mean, not just kind of, you know, you, where you got those logic grid puzzles that you might have done in elementary school when you were younger, and mm-hmm. that you, like, that are essentially what the board game clue is. Exactly, um, yeah. <laughs> so it's not just doing that, but also kind of piecing together and interpreting evidence not just like i know what this evidence means and i'm kind of going through a grid i'm also trying to interpret evidence and there's almost like this level of creativity that's involved or lateral thinking that i really appreciate yes uh hard agree and that's what can make creating a, a good mystery game really challenging right because lateral thinking what one person's perfectly reasonable lateral thinking puzzle is complete gibberish to another person right those those questions of like that are designed to make you think like, oh, a man walks out of a restaurant and commits suicide. Why? And then when told the answer, some people are like, okay, I get it. That made my brain, you know, work for that. And other people are like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. There's no way I'd ever reach that conclusion. Yeah, it's like, did you ever play that old uh, tabletop game, Mind Trap? I think so. Yeah, it has a lot of those kinds of puzzles in it, um, where sometimes you you get to the an- the answer and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And sometimes you flip the card over and you read the answer <laughs> and you're just like, dude, this is yep. stupid. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> and they're all like these kinds of lateral thinking puzzles or riddles or things like that. Um, so it, no but i absolutely I totally agree like going through the motions of doing the detective work actually finding clues and putting them together in logical ways and tying them together into a narrative that makes internal sense and then discovering yep that's the person who designed this puzzle and i are thinking along the same lines is yeah it's it's a lot that's of what so draws satisfying. me yeah yeah mm-hmm. um so another thing that I do appreciate about mystery games is I love plot twists, but I love <laughs> a certain kind of plot twist. I okay. like plot twists that recontextualize what you've already experienced in a surprising but logically coherent way. Yes, agreed. It can't just be a twist for a twist's sake. Yeah. Yeah, like you don't want an ass pull. You want something that just kind of like that is of a piece with what preceded it but that surprises you especially that make you think a different way about something you've already seen (laughs) well so now you're i mean basically what you're describing now is a lot of why immortality worked for me so actually um let's get into it okay you you want to talk about immortality um and we can talk about some some other um mystery games that we've played a little later uh but we've already kind of talked about some fairly standard mystery games and fairly standard mechanics um like you know point and click puzzle solving or logical deduction or very like visual novel style kind of stuff uh but immortality like sam barlow's other fmv games her story and telling lies has a unique interface it Uh, really does about that sure so um i've played all three of those games um I really, really liked her story. It was different than any other game that had come out to date at the time it came out because of the interface you're mentioning. So the premise of her story is you're a person. I don't even know how much about the person you are. (laughs) And you sit down at a computer and you have access to police interview videos of a woman. There's been a death and you're trying to figure out what happened. But all you're doing is watching police interview videos in short clips of one woman, right? And how you get around is 
you type a search phrase into a bar. And if someone ever said that, it'll go find some of the clips. Uh, you know, it won't all of them. It'll give you a handful of when that phrase was mentioned in one of these police videos. Yeah. So if in the first video they give you, she says, oh, no, it was all Marie's fault. Okay, so I'm going to go search for Marie. And then I'm going to go find other clips where people are talking about Marie. And then over time, in your brain, you kind of stitch together the story of what happened. I loved her story. It was great. What do you think of that one? Yeah, that's actually one of the only Sam Barlow game I've played. I, I haven't had time to play Telling Lies or Immortality. Um, I played it a long time ago, so I don't remember it super well. But I think what I appreciated about it at the time I played it was how unique it was for the genre and mm -hmm. how surprisingly engaging it was to interact with the video game in this particular way. Because I never would have thought watching clips, identifying keywords, and then typing them into a search bar could be so much fun. It's so compelling. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. just not a thing you would think of as like anything more than drudgery, but it's so engaging. Yes. And then came Telling Lies, which I have to be frank, I did not like as much as her story. Um, I don't think the story was as... And it's a similar kind of um, interface. You're just jumping from clip to clip, um, trying to piece together a story. And the reason I'm being more vague about uh, telling lies than I am about her story is I don't remember a lot of it. It it didn't make a big impression on me. Yeah, I've I've heard the reception of telling lies is a little bit chillier than the reception to her story, and that might be because people were starting to think of Sam Barlow as a one trick pony, or maybe if telling lies had come out first, people would think that was the brilliant one. So it was maybe. very hard for me to tell from the outside looking in, but I I did hear people were less interested in its story and found its interface more frustrating. Agreed. Yeah. And I don't think it is that they thought that, well, at least in my case, it's not that because the interface was a one trick pony because then came immortality this year and it's similar. Um, instead of typing things in, you click on things. So no need to, you know, write down a list of words you've tried already or anything like that. But uh, let me tell you the premise of Immortality first. Okay, so there's uh, an actress, and she made three movies. One Marissa in the 19... Marcel is her name, right? Yes, Marissa Marcel. Um, one in the 1960s, one in the 1970s, and one in the 1990s. None of those movies were ever released for reasons, which become <laughs> clear during the playing of the game. And then she vanished after, you know, the work on the 1990s movie. And the ostensible mystery is, okay, figure out what happened to this actress who's disappeared. But that's really the least important thing about this game. What it is is, okay, you have clips of the movies that were never released. And when you click on something in the scene that you watch, it'll take you randomly to another scene with something similar component. So, for example, if you click on a cup in a 19... 90s movie, it might take you to a clip of someone drinking from a cup in the 1960s movie. If you click on someone wearing a crucifix, it'll go to a cross in a different scene somewhere. If you click on a cat, it'll go to another cat. Okay. If you click on someone's face, it'll find that person someplace else, right? So you're jumping around in much the same way that you did in her story. But instead of one woman, one story, one location, you are piecing together in bits and pieces three completely different stories, all movies that were never released. So you're watching footage of them making movies. That's just the surface level mystery. And then it turns so out there's like it, uh, layered mysteries beneath that one. It was, oh my God, when, <laughs> it was incredible. I loved it. Go ahead. So I, I got to ask, is it like, could you just say, let the clip keep running and just like watch a movie or no. is there also like behind the scenes footage in these like clips yes so no and yes so when each clip is a set length of time none of them are more than a couple minutes long okay and it'll be like okay we're going to shoot this scene where a cat walks across the camera view and that's the entire scene that's what you're watching it's someone saying scene 25a take three clap cat walks okay. across the screen and then they say cut and that's the whole thing 
<laughs> so it's not like the it's not like the fully edited version of what yeah. would be in the movie. It's what they they film, like the raw footage it's before the, it reaches it's the It's the raw footage. Yep. And okay. and some of it is not even footage from movies. It's them like location scouting or talking about their characters' motivations or let's do a chemistry test to make sure that you and I, you know, will kiss on camera and people can believe it kind of thing. I did um, see there's also a clip like from a talk show where they're interviewing her or something like yep. that. That too, okay. yeah. They they bring her on, and she's just like in real life. They bring an actress on, and she's like, "Yeah, I'm in this movie. I hope you'll go see it." Yeah. And okay. so, the experience of playing the game was piecing together the full story of three separate movies, each of which is interesting in their own right. Then there's the mystery of what happened to this actress, and then there's a mystery that I'm not even going to describe underneath that mystery. <laughs> And then there's a, kind of even a sub mystery under the second mystery. <laughs> um, yeah, I've never platinumed a game so fast in my life. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you really get to kind of dig through. Like, I like games that kind of reveal new layers as you dig through them. If that makes any sense? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I mean, uh, the the surface level is oh, I'm kind of interested in this. And all of the movies are very um, representative of their times, let's say. Yeah. So the the 60s movie is like a religious drama in which the actress, Marissa Marcel, plays a woman who sneaks into a monastery and seduces the head monk there because she's actually an agent of the devil. It's very 60s religious, like, you know, very Cecil B. DeMille kind of oh, okay, yeah. movie. And then, same actress in the 70s is in a very 70s movie about, like, oh, we're just a bunch of beatnik artists and you can't trust us and someone's dead. Oh, was it the model who did it? You know, and let's go do cocaine in a bar. It's so 70s, right? And then the 1990s movie is extremely 1990s. It's about an actress who says, oh, I'm going to send my body double to go do work for me because I'm, I'm too harassed and busy. And she looks like me and sounds like me, so I'm going to go send her to do photo shoots for me. And then, of course, there's violence visited upon one of them, and then the other one is trying to figure out what's happening. And they're all it's all like Tarantino-ish almost. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not that um, frenetic, but it's kind of like a Lifetime movie on, on screen. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I see. Your, <laughs> I see what you're saying. Um, but all three movies are interesting. Like they. I, I was actually interested in what's happening in these three fake movies to the point that I'm like, oh, yeah, I should actually start trying to figure out what happened to this woman. <laughs> so you're kind of like almost getting sidetracked by yes. by the experience of watching this film. Yeah, full disclosure, after I finished, because all of these are in clips out of order, right? So yeah. you, you're putting together the kind of piecing together what happened as you watch three separate movies all jumbled together. Full disclosure, after I finish the game, and you can rearrange the clips into various orders, I rearranged the clips into what they would be in movie order had they been released. And I watched the whole thing, all three of them through, beginning to end, as if I was watching the three movies. And did that like did it tell like a coherent story as a, as a it film? Did. It did, and I noticed things that I hadn't noticed before, like, oh... So this person told you know her to screw off two scenes ago. No wonder she's giving him a dirty look in this other clip. Got it. You know, it's kind of mini mysteries like that. Okay, so like the narrative <laughs> of the movie kind of makes sense after the yes. fact once you've ordered it in a certain yes. way. Yes. So it's almost like this meta mystery on top of all the mysteries you're solving, actually playing through the game. It's exactly, and it's it's so well acted characters with hardly any lines you can get a sense of their lives like there's one who's just the guy who claps you know the clapboard at the beginning of every scene and you can tell when he's like oh my god what's happening behind me is so above my pay grade <laughs> but he he doesn't say that he can just tell in his performance um that's really hard to pull off yeah it's it's i so i so when it comes to games like this though they're really hard to recommend to other people sometimes, right? Because they say, oh, you, you're playing a game that you love? Tell me about it. Sure, you sit down and watch three fake movies out of order. Let, 
people aren't going to go. Like, a lot of people I know don't go for that. But for the people who do go for it, oh, you can be sure I, I contacted them and said, you know, you need to buy this game immediately. I do sometimes find it funny to describe games in really unhelpful ways. Um, <laughs> for instance, Hypnospace Outlaw, which is another kind of unique mystery game. Mm -hmm. um, I describe it as browsing the internet 20 years ago. <laughs> the video game. Yeah. Are you, are you just going like fake web, web pages and looking for stuff? Or? Yeah, pretty much. You are tasked with hunting down internet criminals in an alternate history vaporwave recreation of the late 90s internet. That sounds right up my alley. Yeah. It like the main interface is a desktop, a fake browser, and like a chat window where you can uh, communicate, I guess, with your boss um, or like the the boss of the agency that's kind of employing you to hunt down these internet criminals. I mm -hmm. think that's what it is. It's been a while since I've played it. Does he um, give you hints or something if you're like, listen, boss, I don't know what I'm doing? Uh, no, it's very <laughs> much like... Uh, you really have to kind of figure things out for yourself. It okay. does not hold your hand at all. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's hunting down the, uh, or solving these internet mysteries sometimes involves identifying keywords hidden in, remember those like late nineties web pages with a lot of animated GIFs mm -hmm. and with the gaudy fonts and a lot of blink oh, yeah. and marquee tags in the HTML. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that's what this is like. If you want, were nostalgic for that and you want to see kind of a lo-fi pixel art recreation of that, play Hypnospace Outlaw. And also they've how, like kind of recolored everything vaporwave-ish. So like how's a the, vaporwave How's the mystery aspect, this. though? Is it is it a good mystery or is it just a, like a fun kind of gimmick skin on a, on a mystery game? I would say it's a pretty fun mystery, set of mysteries. So think of it kind of like uh, the Centennial case where there is a series of mysteries and while you're solving those mysteries, you're also kind of piecing together an overarching plot that ties into one big grand mystery. Okay. I like that. Yeah, I... I'm actually, I'm mentioning this, I have to admit, I'm not a huge fan of the game for various reasons, but mm -hmm. a lot of people really, really loved it, and it is a beloved game that it spoke to a lot of people. If you like unique mystery games, definitely check this one out. Okay, yeah, I will look at it. I've been uh, spoiled this year with good mystery games, but I'm always up for more. Yeah, this one's, I think, two years old now, and they just announced a sequel called Dream Settler. Uh, so uh, get into that. If you want to get into that universe, this is the place to start. Um, I'm writing it down. Yeah, there's another mystery game that I wanted to mention I think was really unique, and that's a game called Consortium. Uh, I don't know if you, have you heard of this one. No. Mm -mm. So this is a game that I really loved. It's a murder mystery set aboard an airship. Uh, so imagine if the Normandy from Mass Effect never left the atmosphere. Yeah. And the entire game were set aboard it. Mm -hmm. That's Wait, you... so have you ever heard of murder on the... I'm going to show my age here. Have you ever heard of murder on the Zindernuf? No, I okay. don't. So have, I hate to tell the makers of Consortium this, although they might know it. It's a murder mystery set aboard a Zeppelin, <laughs> um, but it is like Atari 2E graphics, right? It is so old, <laughs> but I was obsessed with it. So this is a futuristic, about, like, it's more like if Star Trek never left the atmosphere. Think okay. It like that. okay. Uh, so it's more futuristic, or you should think of it as an alternate future. Uh, but it has that same idea. It's a, it's a murder mystery kind of confined to a small location. Yeah. I mean, the airship is pretty big. It has some secrets, but it's a self-contained place. Like, there's no no place for the murderer to escape to. Mm -hmm. And 
what's interesting about this game is that it has a super duper rich lore like a novel's worth of lore that you can uh uncover by reading an in-game terminal that's mm-hmm. just like an encyclopedia of what this game's world is like and by coming through this encyclopedia you can uncover what would be the motive for the murderer to act um, i like it yeah but yeah so it has that component but the main component of interaction is walking around in first person and talking to people or sure. not talking to people and then there's also kind of a first person shooter layered in on top of that but there's not that much combat so it's a very weird mashup of genres yeah it sounds wow it sounds like sci-fi f first person shooter research like research based kind of like tacoma right um, yeah mm-hmm. with and it has a bunch of rpg slash aversive sim components in there as well so All right it, it's ambitious you're, you're, for and like this game looks ugly as sin is very oh. <laughs> it's very like uh amateur source engine kind of game i mean it okay. was made in the source engine so it looks super like imagine half-life 2 but with worse graphics kind of oh god kind of thing <laughs> um so it, it the game is ugly, but it is so unique, entertaining, and just plain weird that I I have a lot of respect for it. Um, I should also mention the game is for the most part on an actual kind of in-game timer, so the events that will transpire kind of always will transpire. They might change yep. depending on the actions you take. Um, yeah, there's branching narrative here too, by the way. Oh yeah. Sounds uh, like The Last Express. Did you ever play that one? No. Um, ah, I, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'll, I can describe it a bit when you're done talking about uh, Consortium, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there's like this branching narrative um, and the events in full, unfold in real time in front of you. Uh, so like you discover the body in real time and then how you choose to investigate in the limited time before other stuff happens influences the course of the mystery. Like it's possible to beat the game without solving the murder mystery. No. And then you're meant to kind of replay it and choose different options. Um, and using those uh, like different options, you'll be able to import your choices into the sequel. So you might be starting the sequel, which isn't out yet. It's still in early access. Um, but you might be importing a version of the universe where you solve the murder mystery or a version of the universe where you didn't. Mm-hmm. So super ambitious project total kind of mess of a game it's janky but definitely check it out so hopefully the sequel looks better uh it probably will look better but it's also a big mess right now which is why it's in early access okay Um, so you mentioned the last express what's that all about it was a lot of fun i really liked that game so it did not look janky it was so it's animated in the style of kind of a comic book so all of the characters are drawing and most of it is just, here's a drawing of me in this position. Now the next is a drawing of me in this other position. So it's like a comic book. Although there are scenes of actual movement of these comic people. They were based on you know motion capture people that walking up and down the um, hallway of a train during World War I. So oh, so you... did they like rotoscope the animation? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Oh, that's wonderful. I love Rose. Yeah, after yeah, after we're done, go look it up on YouTube. It's a gorgeous game. Um and you are playing as uh, an American doctor who hops above this train that's very much like the Orient Express. It might even be the Orient Express. Oh, this um, is made by Jordan Mechner. Oh okay. the Prince of Persia guy. That's why I did the rotoscoping. Because that's what Prince of Persia is famous for, the rotoscoped movement animations. Oh, this makes so much sense now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry, please continue. No, it's fine, yeah. Um, so you hop on the train and you discover, you know, the friend you're supposed to meet, you discover his body, and then, bam, the game kicks in because here comes the conductor. And if you don't make the right choices, it's game over right at the beginning. Because you've got a bloody corpse in the room and someone's coming to, you know, check your ticket. So what do you do? Well, you could do many things. You could just sit there and wait for the conductor to come in and try and explain yourself 
You can try and fold the body up into your bed. You can throw it out the window. You can do all sorts of stuff. So, um, so but I, it brought to mind because, uh, as you said, things are going to happen on the train whether you're there or not at certain times. And so... <clears throat> Uh, it's a really great cast of characters. You've got people of all nationalities, and your character speaks, I believe it's English, German, French, and Russian. And oh, so, wow. if char- so if characters are in the distance speaking those, all you hear is those people chattering away in you know foreign languages. And then as you get closer, you get subtitles because you now understand them. And there are other people in the train whose language you don't speak, and you will not get subtitles for them. They're just chattering away in their language. That is so, uh, it's so clever. Like a, it's um, great. It's a spy intrigue murder mystery game. It's it's really fun. I don't know if you can even play it now anymore because it's it was... on Steam. Although oh, they've edited a little bit of it, like some sound effects are apparently missing, um, oh. but it's available. I just want yeah. to say that language thing is so clever because I, I don't know if you speak a second or third language, but that is that is the exact experience. Like, I mean, my first language is English, but I also know um, decently fluent in French and <laughs> I know some Hindi. Uh, so the thing about French is because I don't speak it very often. I understand what I'm engaged in a conversation but I find it very difficult to parse a conversation that I'm overhearing, especially one from mm-hmm. afar where I can't hear every word. I basically can't parse that at all. But if I'm mm-hmm. being spoken to, then I understand perfectly. It's exactly um, like that. Yep. So that, that uh, or like when I get closer to conversation, I hear all the words, I can start piecing it together a little bit. Like th- gamifying that exactly in that way is just like the perfect way to gamify it. Yeah, it's it's a really good component. Uh, it was a very well thought through component of that game. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super interested in this now. Um, Prince of Persia guy, gorgeous animation, cool mechanics, real time uh, unfolding of the story. This is like Merv catnip. Yeah, so. give it a try. Let me know what you think. I, I'd be anxious to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's going in the backlog, and that backlog is like 100 <laughs> yeah. games deep. So, um, you know, call me in five years, sure. and we'll, good. we'll talk about it. But I, I definitely, like, yeah, it's on sale. Sure, I'll pick that thing up. Why not? Um, so kind of go back to to some of my, our favorite mystery games, not just the super unique ones, but favorite ones in general. Um, one series that I did want to mention is and I don't know if, if you've played this one, Dongan Rampa. I played part of one of them, and I don't know if it was the first one or not. Uh, but I didn't finish it. But I know of them, and I've seen lots of like zany clips of them online. Yeah. So I mean, as with most series, I'd recommend starting with the first game of the series because the subsequent ones won't make any sense if you haven't played <laughs> the first one. Um, the idea here is that it's a game where you're where uh, you follow a group of high school students who are trapped in the school through that they attend and are told that they will only be allowed to escape on one condition. They murder one of their fellow classmates and get away with it. Mm -hmm. If they're correctly identified as the killer, then they are also killed, and the game continues. Right. So, what happens over the course of the game is is that some of these students really want to escape, so they murder one of their classmates and then you have to identify them as the murderer in order to progress the story. Now, the way the game is set up is that there are investigation components where you walk around the school and uncover evidence, talk to people, try to piece together what happens. But by the time you reach the end of an investigation segment, you feel like you'll have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. Where you actually piece together what's happening is at the trial segments, which follow the investigation segments, where you play a bunch of wacky mini games and 
have a bunch of logical arguments and uh, debates with your fellow classmates, and this, uh, the story kind of unfolds there. That's how you discover who the killer is. Um, so remember I, we mentioned earlier the difference between uh, games where you really solve the mystery versus where the mystery's kind of parceled out to you? This is mm -hmm. more the latter. So yeah. you do at some point have to finger the correct killer. Um, but in terms of constructing the narrative that explains how the killer did what they did and why, that's kind of fed to you at this trial segment where something you might not have uncovered during the investigation might come up because another student was withholding that information and now they're putting that out there. That was part of my frustration when I was playing it. It was like, yeah, now you're just sh you're just yelling the mystery at me rather than letting me solve it, yeah. Yeah, so you don't really, really solve the mystery. I mean, like, eventually you do have to correctly s select options that show you understand how the thing happened and you do have to identify the killer but at no point do you really um like piece together the evidence in a logical sequence right that's kind of and, and yeah and so you. listening them go through those sometimes interminable conversations during the trial segment where uh, i was like yes i know this i i saw it in the room already we don't have to have a two-minute discussion about it. Um, yeah, it, I think it, that series just wasn't for me, although I did like looking up some of the zany murders on, on YouTube. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I will say this really speaks to my sensibilities because I really, while I find the trials in principle, they sound super frustrating. Like, I'm going to something not knowing what's going on. But then I just kind of let it wash over me. I kind of mm -hmm. just let strap myself into the roller coaster and, you know, let um, uh, Spike Chunsoff take me for a ride. Mm -hmm. So I think if you approach it from that perspective, it's not frustrating. But definitely if you're going into this expecting that you're going to sit down and solve a mystery, I can right. see you really bouncing hard off this game. Yeah, that was my problem, I think. Yeah, I can see why, and conversely, I can see why people like it. It is uh, narratively very compelling. Oh, it's super compelling. And what I love about it is that the twists almost always make sense. Like, there are a lot of wacky twists, mm -hmm. but I very rarely felt like the game was just, like, deus ex machina me to the nth degree. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is off topic, but did you ever see the, um, the you know, Principal Skinner, Superintendent Chalmers, you know, crusty burger scene, but in the style of Danganronpa? Yes. <laughs> I did we'll, like that quite a bit. We will definitely link that in the link dump. I, it's been a long time since I've seen that particular um, steamed hams meme, but <laughs> I will dig it up and try to put that in the link dump. I love steamed ham steam hams memes me too. me too i never get tired of them they're they're invariably they're hilarious <laughs> um another game that i wanted to mention that i played last year uh, i don't know if you've played this one it's called root film no this i think this one i think you'll like um so the premise is that you are a an up-and-coming film director working in Shimane Prefecture, which is on the west coast of Japan as opposed to the east coast. We're used to things happening kind of on the east coast of Japan or the, like the east and south coast, so things like in Osaka and Tokyo, Nagoya, all around that. This is on the other side of Japan, which is less populated, but very touristic and very picturesque. Um, so you get to play a game with this really profound and nice sense of place. Mm -hmm. Um, and the premise Good is, atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, the atmosphere is wonderful. It's like digital tourism, but there's a, mist, a murder mystery layered on top. Um, so the idea is that you're a director uh, trying to uncover the mystery of a certain film from many years ago. Um, in that respect, a little bit like the premise of Immortality. I was just thinking that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so in particular, you're trying to discover... Um, the 
you try to discover the mystery behind a film that starred a famous actress, uh, Riho, who worked several years ago. And then at the same time, you're also going back in time and solving mysteries that Riho herself was involved in. So there's like this mm -hmm. dual narrative going on. Um, I'm not going to spoil the twist with the Riho mysteries, but there's an interesting reframing of them later in the game. Um, interesting. This okay. almost sounds like a hybrid of what I just said were my top two games of the year, which is the Centennial case, and Immortality. It sounds like those two got together and had a baby called Root Film. So yeah, I'm absolutely going to check this one out. I will say it's a worse written game than both of those. Uh, not okay. having played Immortality, <laughs> I'm just assuming. Uh, yeah. It is not like the best written game I've ever played or anything. So don't go in. Ex the mysteries are really good, but don't. That's, yeah, expect... that's all I need. That's all I need. Yeah. <laughs> like expect a lot of cringy anime dialogue. It's in there. Expect some like pointless perviness. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's in there for sure. Oh yeah, I should have also given a content warning about immortality. Yeah, there is nudity. There is uh, violence, obviously, but uh, I mean, like. There's, there are art films, so of course there is. <laughs> yeah, there's. I, I will say there's no nudity in uh, what you might call it, root film, but there is violence mm -hmm. and uh, point, a, a bunch of pointless bikini scenes because you know it's that kind of game. Um, so, but other than that, I will say, really nice mysteries, really clever mysteries. Um, really um really good uh like sense of place like i said digital tourism it's a big mm -hmm. thing uh in this game and on top of that what's really neat about it is um it doesn't hold your hand very much so Yes, it's kind of set up like a visual novel, uh, so there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of talking. But when it comes to actually investigating, uh, the game doesn't tell you, like, go to this exact location to find this piece of evidence. Um, it kind of just kind of sets you loose. You have like, at some point, you know, ten locations to pick from, and then you figure out whom you have to talk to to advance the plot. Um, so you really do have to get into the mystery, gather all the evidence, and then piece together um, the answer. Like it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to check that out. I really enjoyed it. Um, it didn't make my top 10, but I played way too many games in 2021. <laughs> so uh, I think it, it's out there for those who are interested in it. Do you uh, have a kind of a format preference between an animated mystery game or a for, or FMV one? I think to a first approximation, I prefer animated, mm -hmm. but I love FMV games for doing something different. Um, so you could probably make an animated version of the Centennial case, but so much of what makes the Centennial case what it is is the fact that it's FMV. Yeah, agreed. Um, so I think overall I prefer animated games, but FMV games do different things. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. It does, yeah. Yeah. So it really depends what I'm in the mood for. Um, I, I mean, I don't know that many FMV mystery games. I know there's uh, Centennial Case, and there's also, yep. uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Contradiction um, Spot the Liar. I liked that. It wasn't particularly well acted, but I liked the mystery in that one. Yeah. And there's one that's on my Steam wish list whose name is escaping me that is this new, uh, I think it's a Chinese game. Uh, mm -hmm. It's FMV mystery, but its name is escaping me at the moment, so I will dump that in the link dump unless I can uh, figure it out while you're talking about uh, FMV games. Yeah, um, 
I do tend to prefer FMV games, at least when it comes to mystery, uh, precisely of what you said is, is you can get much more of the human element with something that's acted, right? So um, a good example from a couple years ago was Erica. Did you ever play that? No, sorry. So yeah, Erica was, you know, your dad is either missing or dead, I forget which, and you're trying to figure out what happened and it is fully FMV um, and it is controlled by your phone. And what I mean by that is like you drag your finger across the screen and Erica looks in that direction and sees something and, you know, behind her. Um, that, That's you know, really contribute. Neat. It was very neat. Yeah, it's a pretty small game. It doesn't take long. Um, I think it has branching story paths, if I remember correctly. It has been a few years, but I believe it was my top game of the year it came out in. I really liked Erica quite a bit. You mentioned um, <clears throat> Contradiction Spot the Liar. I liked that one, too. It was very cozy English town mystery, which I like that kind of atmosphere. And uh, what was the other one I was about to mention? How would that work on PC if you were playing Erica? Does it have to be played on a phone? I think... I played it on console and used the phone, so I don't know how it, how it would go on PC. I don't even know if it's available on PC. Okay, I'll, I'll have to look that up because it yeah. sounds interesting. It was. I really liked it, and um, uh, not just going to mention good ones. I also played a new murder mystery FMV game this year called, and this is the dumbest title I've ever heard, "Who Pressed Mute on Uncle Marcus?" Question mark. And I was like, okay, well. It's a mystery game, and it's FMV, so I'm going to play it. And I did, and it clearly was made during COVID because no one is ever in the same room as anyone else. And um, they're, it's about a family, and they're having a video chat, and you, the protagonist, have to figure out you know, who has poisoned Uncle Marcus. You are able to save his life if you are able to you know, identify the poison that he's poisoned with and who did it. But the so gameplay does, itself— like, the narrative branch? No. Okay, so well, you, if like, you, answer, you can't beat well, the game unless I mean, you say Uncle Marcus. The game, no, that's not true. You can end the game. I wouldn't say you beat it. <laughs> um, you can accuse anyone you want. You can identify the poison as any uh, a number of them, and if you're wrong, of course, there are consequences. So um, I like that aspect of that it. That but... almost reminds me of Paradise Killer, which you could talk about in a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry, continue. No, it's fine. Uh, this one is, so it, your family is running a trivia, a online trivia quiz, but only family members are playing, right? And it's, it's not very good. Um, it's not super well acted. There's like theatrical makeup all over the main actress's sweater that I guess no one noticed except for me. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> uh, the mystery is not very compelling. I was I was disappointed in that one, That's but I mean shame. I'm a sucker for FMV mysteries. So, well, if you yeah. do want another FMV mystery, the Chinese FMV mystery game that came out this year that is episodic, that I couldn't remember the name of, is called Underdog Detective. It's available Underdog. on Steam. I'm writing it down. Yeah. Um, I think the way it works is. You can buy episodes one to five, and then episodes six to seventeen are available for a higher price as DLC. Goodness. And so each episode is a separate case with the same character, or I actually have no idea. <laughs> All I know is that it came out in April of this year. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's Chinese with English subtitles. So. Okay. Good. Again, I, I don't know much about this game. I've just kind of had it recommended to me as being somewhat similar to the Centennial case, though not as good. Okay. Uh, but it's there if you would like it. Yep, I'm going to check into it for sure. So, yeah, I just there's something about FMV that, on top of the mystery itself, kind of attracts me. I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's the fact that there's a kind of expressiveness you can get with FMV that is hard to get with animation. Um, and it kind of, this is going to sound a, a little strange. It's not so much the expressiveness, although that's part of it. It's that the expressiveness is very theatrical. And I think 
murder mysteries um, kind of play off that theatrical element. So mm-hmm. even modern, like even more modern kind of satirical mysteries like your Gosford Parks and your Knives Outs, they kind of play off the theatrical element. Like they don't just feel like movies, they feel like plays in movie sets, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of a different form of soap opera almost, yeah. Yeah. So I think it, with FMV, you get that dramatic theatrical element that is makes mysteries feel like kind of extra juicy in a way. <laughs> yeah. That's what I, uh, I mean, like I'm saying this is someone who, who loved Knives Out. I really love that. Oh, sentiment. me too. Yeah. Um, so I do kind of seek that out in mystery games, even if at the end of the day, I do prefer like your very, very more standard mystery games. I do kind of seek that out from time to time. And I'm looking at the Steam page of Underdog Detective right now. I'm just like, damn, why didn't I play this when it came out? <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll see how that goes. Um, so are there any of like your favorite mystery games that you wanted to mention before we uh, move on to the last kind of topic? We've really, we've covered a lot of them. Um, there's others that are kind of um, what I call more simplistic games. So they have like actual mystery games like the ABC murders or Hercule Poirot's first cases, or, you know, it, they're a lot more straightforward. Yeah. Go here, find the clue, you know, solve the murder. And those are good. I like them. They're fun. They're just, I, I think you and I have already talked about the, the ones that are a little more special, a little juicier than, you know, straightforward. I still do enjoy the real simple ones too. I am one, this is weird. I am one of the four people that could not get into the return of the Obra Dinn. And I'm not sure why. I don't know if it was the graphic style. I don't know if it was the, the way you went about piecing together the mystery. Um, I didn't love it as much as everyone else did. It can be an acquired taste from what I understand. Yeah, and but I can see why they liked it. I, I mean, it's different, which is good, and it's interesting, and I like the premise a whole lot. I just the gameplay kind of didn't do it for me. I do um, wonder what Lucas Pope is working on now, because like Papers Please and Oberdin are two vastly different games. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I did like Papers Please, um, and there are what I would call. Oh, you know, like, did you play the, the newest uh, Life is Strange game called True Colors? I did not play True Colors. I've played I played two Life is Strange games. I've played one and two. I haven't played Before the Storm or True Colors. Now, would you call those mystery games? I would say Life is Strange 1 is a mystery game. Life is Strange 2 is not. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, Life is Strange... Episode 4 of Life is Strange 1 has... I think one of the best mystery solving sequences in all of video games. It's been so long I don't remember which which what happens in that episode. That's the one where you're trying to piece together um your story of there's been, there's a murder in that game, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so you're trying to piece together the story of the murder and you end up with a whole bunch of evidence that you have to kind of arrange into a coherent story and you're kind of building a timeline on a cork board or a whiteboard, just like they do in detective shows on TV. Sure. Yeah. That's yeah. So yeah, absolutely. That, that's mystery related. I would call life is strange. True colors mystery too. Although I think reasonable people, reasonable people could disagree with me on that one. It, this true colors is more, I mean, Life is Strange itself is plenty emotional, but True Colors even more so because you can sense people's emotions in that game and they it's radiate out of them. literalizing emotions. I think that's what kind of turned me off playing it, is that it just came across uh, as a naive, judgmental outsider as really hokey. Um, but... I think it could be read that way. I wound up really... Um, I didn't buy it. It was bought for me as a gift, and I'm like, sure, I'll try it. And I wound up liking it a lot more than I thought I would. That's good to hear, uh, because yeah. I do want to give it a chance. I don't want to be that judgy guy who's like, it 
emotions. I'm a man. I don't have real emotions. <laughs> um, like, I don't want to be like that. So I, uh, yeah. I probably should go check it out. Sometime we'll sh- we should uh, have an episode about games that made you ball like a baby, and we can talk about <laughs> Spirit Bearer or something like that. I'm trying um, to think, did any games make me come close to crying? Oh, gosh. I might be, <laughs> I might have a lump of coal for a heart. I can't think of a game, but maybe Life is Strange 2? Mm-hmm. Um, I never since we're all stuck to Life is Strange, like, let, let, yeah. let's take a detour for a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, so I played Life is Strange 2. Uh, I was like a like about a year late to the party. During lockdown for COVID, um, and this was in, while well, I was living in New York City, which had one of the strictest lockdowns in sure. the United States. Um, and it was also around the time of the George Floyd protests, which mm-hmm. had erupted in New York City. And, like, they were pretty severe in New York. Like, people were getting arrested right off the streets about three blocks from where I lived. Um, and, I mean, there weren't protesters on my street, but not too far. Um, so I could hear the protesting at night, and uh, I could hear ambulances taking COVID patients to the hospital at night um, all around. And so I was playing it in July of 2020. And I finished it the night of July 4th. So Mm -hmm. as I was playing the final sequence, I'm hearing protests all around, ambulance sirens, and fireworks going off as um, the main characters are making a break for the Mexican border. And that was one of the most surreal gaming experiences I've ever had in my life. Yeah, it sounds, yeah really emotional that was like, heavy anyways yeah <laughs> i don't think it brought me to tears i was just like wow that's like that's a lot <laughs> going on at once yeah that is real sensory bit. and and like mental overload <laughs> um but yeah uh life is strange too not exactly a mystery game more of a road game i would say yeah, I, never, I didn't play that one. I don't know why I played one and True Colors and not anything else. But two is very, very different from one. Like mm. it's it aside from the episodic structure and the aesthetics, it has none of the same ideas as Life is Strange One. Like in my view, the real sequel to Life is Strange One is another kind of quasi mystery game. Tell me why. Oh, I love Tell Me Why. Yeah, I I also loved Tell Me Why, and yeah. I loved um, I love that it is kind of a mystery game because you are trying it to is. piece together what happened uh, the night that um, your the night that your brother killed your mom. Right, or is that what happened? Yeah, or is it's that really more of a happened? yeah, it's 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 more of an emotional mystery than a a logical one, and I. Like as as mentioned above, immortality is like that too. And uh, yeah, tell me why was a, a, just a ripping good story with a very good mystery component. Yeah, absolutely. And I do like it. Actually, to me, kind of fulfills both that emotional mystery and that more deductive mystery. Because mm-hmm. okay, I guess we can spoil this. Uh, the last <laughs> episode has a big deductive mystery slash puzzle component. Mm -hmm. Um, where you are kind of taking in evidence and ideas from other things you've gleaned throughout the game and using that to solve something that we won't spoil. No, and graphically, that part of the game is very awesome as well. Yeah, it's super neat. I'm a huge... um, I'm I'm a huge stan for it. I shill for Tell Me Why a lot. I I tell (laughs) people to play it. Because to me, that's don't nod taking the promise of life is strange one and actually executing on that vision in a really meaningful and wonderful way. Um, life is strange two is also a game I love, but it's it it might as well not even be called life is strange. It's a completely okay. different experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so 
finally, the one thing I wanted to talk about uh, before we call this to a close uh, is that the genre of mystery games seems to have had a huge influence throughout the industry on a whole range of games that kind of incorporate mysteries into the narrative or the ideas of the game where they might have like this mystery component but it's not the central part of the game sure Um, and so this kind of takes two forms one where the games are built around mysteries but don't really feature mystery solving as a mechanic so i think of games like persona 4 which is centered around um a a mystery of serial abductions and murders or yakuza 0 which is centered around the mystery surrounding a vacant lot and Hmm. or the wolf among us which sounds like it should be an actual puzzle game because it's an an adventure telltale adventure game but you really don't solve mysteries no i did play the wolf among us yeah and i liked it quite a bit but i would agree with you that you're not really applying mystery solving skills to it yeah it's very much a kind of choose your own adventure exactly book, interactively yeah. like there is a little bit of puzzle solving but not very much uh, not like the walking dead season one which has actual puzzles in it um yeah and i think that's so i think that's neat to have like these mystery narratives layered on top of other games Espe- like Persona 4 is actually one of my favorite fictional mysteries of all time. Um, And I'm not going to spoil what it's about. But it's so well told, even though the gameplay in that game is dungeon crawling and turn-based JRPG combat. Uh, So it is really nice to almost get that contrast of... Mm -hmm something that you'd interact with as a mystery game but with this completely different genre under it yeah it scratches a bit of the the mystery itch without being a i would call a mystery game yeah yeah it really depends what i'm looking for sometimes i'm looking for that narrative but i don't want to sit there and reason through it (laughs) and that's when games like this scratch an itch for me uh the other kind of version of this is missions or quests in games that have mystery components, but the game itself is not a mystery game. So uh, there's the Masquerade Ball in Dragon Age Inquisition. Uh, there's the Murder Mystery Mission in Deus Ex Mankind Divided, which is a completely <laughs> optional side mission, but it is like an actual murder mystery that you have to solve by piecing together evidence and like walking through a crime scene and figuring yep. out how a body could have gotten to a certain place it's really neat yeah i yeah i agree with about about dragon age inquisition too the kind of yeah what happens here kind of thing also i feel like was it new vegas or fallout 4 where you go into a particular vault and like something went down in this vault and you kind of have to piece together from the terminals and the and things you're seeing like oh something some sort of (laughs) murder definitely happened here i don't know we'll include that in the linked up i have played new vegas not four uh but i think it was new vegas couldn't tell you what happened in new vegas because i kind of beelined that game i know that's not how you're supposed to play it like (laughs) i only have 28 or so hours logged in that game uh because i just went straight like i just played the plot straight through through no like you said this is completely optional completely side it's just one of many vaults that dot the landscape and you go in and uh, you know rather than searching for equipment it's really just a self-contained murder story within one vault in in the game that's so neat Mm -hmm. Um, like to have this this thing that's almost not exactly sectioned off but that mystery is there for you to engage with if you want to engage with it um, and I love that more and more games are allowing you to kind of scratch that mystery itch on a micro scale. Oh, yeah. I'm always happy to see see that mechanic in a game somewhere. Um, I've seen it in card games, too. Um, uh, it's not video game, but we play our uh, Arkham Horror card game quite a bit. And there is one scenario where it's it's basically Clue. 
<laughs> well, while you're playing Arkham Horror, so I mean that's that's super fun. So. I didn't know that they had like an Arkham. It's is it with the board or is it a separate card game? It's purely cards. Okay. Yeah. I remember playing Arkham Horror once a really long time ago. Yeah, um, the original board game is not very good. <laughs> they've I was they've made say, improvements since. They've made improvements, but I yeah, still I the played game. the original board game. Uh, and that was not the most fun I've ever had playing no. a board mm-hmm. game. Uh, <laughs> doubly compounded in awkwardness because I was playing with, uh, I was playing it alongside a couple that was on the rocks. Oh, not no. the best thing to play with. No. Uh, not the best way to enjoy a co-op board game. No, better than playing werewolf with a couple on the rocks, but still, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that I think would be kind of like. I don't. That'd be kind of like entertaining in a popcorn munching kind of way. <laughs> like you know, sometimes you go to IKEA and you just like watch the couples that are arguing yeah. and you're mm-hmm. laughing. It's that same sort of. Shot I don't know. It me. makes me uncomfortable, but yeah. I um, find it hilarious. I I might be a bad person, <laughs> but, but yeah. yeah, the mystery, a mini mystery within a game that's not a mystery. I'm I'm never uh, unhappy to see it for sure. Absolutely. Are there any that you wanted to mention uh, other than the the vault? Do you make, can you think of any? I think others? that's the only. I th- you mentioned the ones that I'm most familiar with. You know, Inquisition and Wolf Among Us and and such. I'm racking my brain to think of other games that I played that just happened to have a, a mystery plopped in the in the middle. I can't can't really think of any other ones. Um, like there's there's one that I think kind of teeters on the edge of being a mystery game but also not being a mystery game um and that's the game judgment have you heard of this one Mm-mm, no uh have you heard of the yakuza series i've heard of it but i've never played it okay um so just to explain the premise of the yakuza series it's imagine shenmu but good <laughs> uh, uh so you play as someone involved with the Japanese criminal underworld and you walk around town doing various errands for people, playing mini games and engaging in brawler combat. They're set on these very dense but uh, compact open world maps and uh, so they're super detailed, lots of urban detail, flashing lights, signs, uh, lots of food to virtual food to consume, uh, and they all have these really emotional, sometimes very wacky, uh, kind of um, ridiculous crime stories that remind you of a Japanese cable drama. I guess mm-hmm. that's kind of where they're drawing their inspiration from. Um, I should qualify that. The first game owed a, was kind of a mashup of Japanese crime films and North American neo-noir. And then it kind of deviated from that North American neo-noir influence and became basically a Japanese soap opera. Um, yeah, um, I can't marry those two styles in my head. I, I'm having trouble picturing it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it was a really unique kind of vibe. Um, it's really only the first couple of games in the series, and those first two games were remade, and they kind of lost that vibe when they were remade. Um, but it was a really unique thing. It was like playing, I guess, imagine a Japanese crime drama mashed up with Donnie Darko. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. Yeah. I Again, I don't know if it worked very well, because I've only played the remakes. I haven't played like the original Yakuza 1 and 2. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's Yakuza. The studio that made it, uh, Ryuga Gotoku, which means like a dragon, um, they decided they wanted to make a spinoff of this set on the same map, the same fictional red light district of Tokyo. And this one would be called Judgment, where instead of playing as a member of the Japanese criminal underworld, you play as a private eye, solving cases. Mm -hmm. But you don't do a lot of actual mystery solving. Mostly solving cases involves going to locations the game tells you to, beating up bugs, or trailing suspicious people and trying not to get caught. Mm -hmm. 
So oh, it's, it's Assassin's Creed. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine. Uh, oh, there's also parkour stuff in there. So basically, yep. imagine you took Yakuza setting and mechanics and you married them to a couple of mechanics born from Assassin's Creed. Mm hmm. <laughs> And there are a few segments that are a little bit L.A. noirish, where you're investigating crime scenes, but you don't do really much puzzle solving. There's a little bit of it towards yeah. that, like where you're kind of piecing together a few things, but really it's more like, what if you made Shenmue that was not terrible, and then we added, we made it about a private eye. Hmm. Um, I really liked it. I would recommend playing Judgment. The sequel is out. Uh, just came out on PC, I think, last week in a surprise Shadow Drop release. Um, so if you want to play that, it's there. It's on PlayStation yeah. and PC and Xbox as well, I believe. Uh, I haven't played the sequel yet because I was waiting for the PC release. Um, so I will probably play that uh, at some point before the end of the year. Yep, I just put it on the list to at least uh, look into, yeah. Yeah, I think you do have to like brawler combat. If you don't like brawlers, you will bounce very hard off this game. Uh, but if you like the idea of virtually touring a Japanese red light district, it's based off the real life uh, Kabukicho, uh, except for this one's called Kaburocho. Uh, it was based off that real life red light district in to the point where you can identify landmarks in Kabukicho and match them to landmarks in Kamurocho. Um, hmm. So they, they did their virtual tourism really well. Um, so you do have to like the brawler stuff, but if you like the brawler stuff and also want to do some virtual tourism and also want to um, like experience a pretty good mystery tale, Definitely worth checking out. I will. All right. Um, any other things you want to mention about mystery games? Um, I mean, just bringing up Assassin's Creed, uh, I know there were kind of mini mysteries sometimes within those. I don't know if I'd really categorize them as mystery is when, you know, you do have to hunt down clues and then, you know, execute judgment on someone. But there's never any doubt that you're going to solve that. It's basically a handheld for you. Uh, I will mystery. say the, the first game in the series isn't so handheld with tracking right. down, um, like creating a plan to execute the like your targets. I right. mean, there is only one conceivable plan that will work, um, and you have to discover exactly that plan. But the game doesn't really hold your hand in terms of gathering the evidence or the information you need to devise that plan. Right. So I'd, I'd say the first game, you really do feel a little bit like an assassin, and that's completely lost in the sequels, where, true, which yeah. are really just like open world map games. Go here, do this task, execute mm -hmm. that dude. Except for the, the glyph puzzles in the Ezio series. Those were very mysterious and fun, but yes, agreed otherwise. Oh, yeah, I, I completely skipped those. Um, oh, they're so much fun. You can't I, do that. I, maybe, I should go back and do them. <laughs> Mind you, I've only played up to Brotherhood. I am very yeah, far behind with this it's, series. It's, it's either in the first Ezio or in Brotherhood. I think it might be Brotherhood, the glyph puzzles. Um, I will say there is a there, one of those glyph puzzles is one of the most chilling. Like, it chilled my blood. <laughs> so, yeah, it was I, I liked that aspect of, of Assassin's Creed. You also mentioned L.A. Noir, which. I mean, I drove around very politely around the streets of L.A. and and we were really just focused on the mystery components of that game. That was the only thing I was interested in. I've definitely failed missions in that game because I accidentally ran over a Rusty. <laughs> um, I always made my partner drive. I'm like, nope, I'm not interested in that. I, just, I will. I just want to solve a mystery. <laughs> I will say. Um, L.A. Noir has, I think, one of my favorite mystery stories and one of my least favorite mystery stories in all of gaming. Um, L.A. Noir is 11 years old now. We can spoil it. Yeah, let's spoil it. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, there's a whole... Most of the game is one coherent, continuous narrative, mm -hmm. except for one very lengthy chapter 
that you could pretty much remove from the game without consequence. And it's a homage to the Black Dahlia murders, mm-hmm. um, yep. which are a famous series of murders in Los Angeles. Um, the whole premise of the, the series of murders is that um, nobody on the force or none of your hot, your superiors believe that any of these murders are correct. And they keep telling you that going after a serial killer is a waste of time. So what this chapter of the game does is it subverts the game's mechanics. Now you have to construct a story to frame a guy for the mm-hmm. murder and frame them in a, in a satisfying way that'll make your superiors happy. Of course, you don't fully know while you're playing this, like it's not fully indicated whether or not this is a real serial killing or not until you get to the end of the chapter when it's discovered that it is a real serial killing um, and you do find the real culprit but for I believe the culprit is related to someone famous or important so you can't actually uh, convict them or something like that Mm -hmm. so it becomes this like very cynical side quest almost that you're forced to play for eight hours um and that's one of my least favorite um one of my least favorite mystery stories in gaming the reason Mm -hmm. i found it so frustrating is because i was not i knew i was framing people and i didn't understand what constituted believable or unbelievable framing right yeah you mean you're not an expert at that? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, I haven't framed people for very many crimes in my life. <laughs> at least not yet. Things could change pretty fast. Who knows? Sure. Um, Marketable skill. I should put that on my resume. <laughs> Have not yet framed anyone for murder. <laughs> Your special <laughs> skills. But could if so chose. <laughs> yeah, I played L.A. Noir. It's just, I can do it. Yeah. yeah. Gaming, valuable skill generation. Um, <laughs> and then it also, can, Eleanor also contains one of my favorite mystery stories in games, which is the overarching story of, uh, the, the, rela- of the relationship between, like, uh, it's morphine, right? Illegal morphine smuggling and how so. that relates to uh, a real estate deal. And how that real estate deal relates to the suburban development of um, Southern California. Yeah, very, very Roger Rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so by the time you get to the game, and it doesn't have the most satisfying conclusion, it's almost this meditation on, like, yes, we got. The, the LA suburbs and we had the post-war economic boom but was it all worth it? Yeah. And yes, there's there's certainly not the neat and tidy um, well we did it conclusion at the end of a lot of other mystery games for sure. Yeah. Yeah, like you saw the mystery. Um, some of the culprits faced consequences uh, but there was a great personal cost to solving that mystery. Um I know a lot of people don't like the protagonist switch at the end. I thought it was brilliant <laughs> uh, to like get the other side of that story and like piece together uh, everything as someone who didn't have those investigative powers. Right. I will say this. I mentioned the Yakuza series earlier. I like to call Yakuza Zero the Japanese L.A. noir because it's dealing with a lot of the same ideas, except for instead of um, large parts of suburban Los Angeles, it's dealing with a specific lot in Tokyo. And instead of being about the post-war economic boom in the United States, it's about the 80s economic boom in Japan. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, stories actually bear a lot of similarities. And the mysteries at the center of them are fairly similar. So, yeah, if you're I can into, see the parallel. Yeah, 
that's my that's my like pitch for Yakuza Zero for people who've <laughs> played LA Noir. You want to play the same story in Japan, and this time instead of shooting people, you get to beat them up. Go ahead and try it out. <laughs> All right, I think that's kind of everything about mystery games that could be said, and then some. Um, yeah, make more, please, uh, entertainment community. I'm always hungry for more of them. So, absolutely, and I this podcast has inspired me to go play some mystery games. Like the second I finish Soul Hackers two, I'm firing up Lost Judgment because I really want to <laughs> play through another like gripping mysterious yarn and i don't want to like keep i don't want to like go borrow uh clive cussler jd robb books or louise penny books from the library uh they don't really scratch the same itch right Um, but no no disrespect if you like reading airport novels uh but not really my jam unfortunately no, I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, if you would like to keep up to date with the podcast, you can follow us on our website at avocadogamescast.wordpress.com. At that website, we post each episode along with a link dump that contains links to some of the stuff we discussed. So that uh, Donga Rampa parody of Steamed Hams <laughs> is definitely making its way in there. <laughs> provided it's still up on YouTube and hasn't been DMCA'd to help. Oh, I hope so, yeah. You can also subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Just search for Avocado Gamescast. And we mentioned the Avocado earlier. The Avocado is the community that gave rise to this podcast. I asked a bunch of folks there if they wanted to start a gaming podcast, and some of them were like, yeah. And others were like, are you sure you want to start a podcast, Merv? And I told the naysayers to go suck an egg. We're starting a podcast. You can find that community at the-avocado.org. Also, to those naysayers, I'm sorry if I told you to go suck an egg. You're probably a cool person. I love you all the same. All right. Curl and Mustard, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you for having me. This was a blast. It was so... I would love to have you back. and We can talk more about mystery games or other games you've played. or I don't know. We can just talk about, like, Knives Out all day long <laughs> if you want. I, I could. I could go on at length about it, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you to our listeners for tuning in. And I have to kill a spider that just descended from my ceiling into my trash can. So I will go do that, and I will talk to you next time. Take care, everyone.